Well, thank you very much, Andrea. Uh, my name is Jeff, uh, and as Andrea said, I am part of the Save the Boundary Waters campaign. There's a nonprofit uh, called Northeastern Minnesotans for Wilderness, which is the lead uh, organization behind the Save the Boundary Waters campaign. We've been working on this, uh, what started as a little little engine behind the campaign about uh, 11, 12 years ago. And now we've, through a lot of uh, wonderful um, support and greater awareness, um, we've grown into a bit of a force of trying to drive a more public awareness, more political awareness, uh, and we, we've been grateful to, uh, through the support of many of our champions, we have a 20-year uh, mineral withdrawal uh, in the Boundary Waters watershed that uh, was put in place last year, but we're still working hard towards permanent protection. Um, so lots to, lots to do there still. Thank you all for your interest support. Be happy to chat about it afterwards if you have interest or you can look up our website. But we're here really to learn a little bit about and celebrate with these artists in Boundary Waters um, as just an iconic place. Uh, and I'm going to ask a, a few questions of, of our talented artists here and, and hopefully just elicit some uh, uh, fun discussion. Um, audience participation is welcome. Uh, so if you have a question uh, uh, throughout, feel free to raise your hand and we'll leave a little bit of time at the end as well. Um, so maybe by way of introduction for each of you, can you tell us a little bit about how you started to do any work in or around the Boundary Waters um, and what your you know favorite medium is in terms of, of the work there? Joshua, you want to kick us off? Uh, sure. Um, I'm primarily a plein air painter. Um, doing that in the Boundary Waters means you're packing for another person because you have all of your, all of your painting equipment with you as well. Um, my time painting in the Boundary Waters has been pretty limited, but the seeds planted by family trips to the Boundary Waters when I was a little kid and bringing my sketchbooks with me and the inspiration of it all, the paintings that my dad chose to have in the house as a kid. He was always inspired by the Voyagers and the stories of those places. And so for us, the portages even weren't so much a experience of hard labor, but a chance to walk the path of other people who had gone before us. And so that, that and the pulling over of maps, which you guys were just doing before we started, like all of those things matriculated into wherever I'm painting. Um, Charles Lyon, I first visited the Boundary Waters uh, with my wife in 1975, and I didn't know anything about the Boundary Waters. Uh, and uh, I was completely overwhelmed. I just was fascinated and went back the next year, but then there was a long period when I didn't go up there. And then I made uh, four trips this last uh, four years. So I'm, I don't paint out there either. I mean, you make a really good point. If you bring all the equipment out there it, and, and you portage it, and you know, it, it would be very difficult to do. So I take a lot of photographs and uh, use those as references. How, how, I'm just curious, how sharp is your memory? This must be my wellness exam. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, pretty good. <laughs> well, I ask in the, in the, in the scheme of painting from the photos, but also in the moment. Is, oh, are there things that um, just stay with you that you know that you want to capture? Oh, yeah. No, you'll be there and see something that you really want. And, um, you know, you take away too many photographs of it. But you eventually, back in the studio, you can distill it and you're able to really um, focus in on what you saw. Sure, gosh, thank you, Holly. Well, um, I've only been to the Boundary Waters once, and it was in the late 70s. Mm. I had just moved to Wisconsin. Uh, we were transferred there, and coming from Chicago, the concrete was pushing me in, mm -hmm. and so I sought out a landscape class in Chicago. So I had already been involved working from nature. And when we moved to uh, Wisconsin, there was um, a little ad in the paper about a photography trip to Quatico with Tom Utek. And I brought this uh, artist because to me, uh, he is um, so um, well inspiring. And he's worked from the Boundary Waters Quatico his entire life. And you can welcome to look. So it was kind of an honor to really be with him. Um, 
and um, I, I hadn't, I didn't, you had to get interviews, so I had no, no, I had very little canoe experience, and uh, I didn't know anyone, but he, he took me on anyway, so. Um, now I've been fortunate, big circle of life, returning to Minnesota, and I'm able to get around the Baldy waters, not so much in it, and I've been very grateful to spend the last 30 years making visits to the North Shore, and uh, basically from like Toski to Grand Marais, but then um, uh, Linda Gamble and I, and uh, Chris Rowan, I see you, Liz here, I uh, made connections with Ely to go up to Ely and do work up there, so it's kind of a full circle. There's, there's more but I'll tell you later. <laughs> that sounds good. Yeah, I want to hear more about the North Shore, another iconic place. I'm sure most of us, uh, another favorite place of ours, and you've been painting up there for uh, a long time, too, right? Okay, William, uh, how about you? Yeah, I started, uh, when I was a kid, my father uh, took us up to Lake Superior, and that had such an impact on me. I mean, you know, you, you can't conceive the, the space that's there. And... Um, after I uh, graduated high school, I went into the military back in the, in the 70s, and um, I was on a Coast Guard uh, icebreaker, the Sundu, which is actually in, the, in uh, Duluth on display. And I was on that ship for about um, uh, four, or about, about three and a half years, and then I was stationed at Duluth Station. And when I was at Duluth, I had a friend who had been transferred from the Sundu to Duluth, and then he was transferred again um, to the to uh, Duluth Station. And so I would come up and, and visit him, and he was a real good friend of mine. And um, it was it, it was such a magnificent place, and I had never ever known that it was up there. It was, it was pretty weird. And, um, but when I started going up the gun flip, people would talk to me about going up the gun flip. And I would do that, and I was just in awe of what that offered uh, an artist, you know, an artist. That's, to me, like the best thing I could have found. And, uh, I was a teacher inside Stillwater Prison for uh, 40 years, and uh, I started all the art programs in Minnesota. And it was uh, also my boss demanded that I take a week off and go up there and, uh, you know, just kind of uh, take it easy for a week. <laughs> it was it was more than I could possibly be aware of. And uh, so my wife and I have been going up there uh, uh, for, for quite some time. And it still holds that magic to me. It, it, it's just, when you're driving down the trail, it's, uh, it just moves me. And I don't paint out in the wilderness because there's something called bugs. <laughs> I do not like bugs when I'm painting. You know? And so, yes, I do, a, uh, I do a lot of photography, and I use that photography as a uh, reference and change things and move things around, and, and uh, that's kind of what I do. And my favorite medium is uh, watercolor. And um, I just still love watercolor. That's what I, I learned that it was the hardest form of painting that there is. And I thought, well, let's get into that. <laughs> so you're an instructor. Why is it the hardest? The hardest? Yeah, why is it the hardest? You said watercolors are the hardest. Oh, um, my uncle was a professor at uh, Boston University. And uh, we would talk about that when I was a kid. And, you know, I've read a lot of watercolor books, and they talk about how it is, 
in their opinion, one of the hardest forms of cancer. And um, I was very proud to be able to get as far as I did. <laughs> and, um, you know, that's about it. And you seem to have mastered it. <laughs> oh. um, we, your, uh, your comments, I think, were so articulate about the special places. Um, I bet many of us felt that. Yeah. Uh, I'll say for myself, who I'm, I'm, I'm not, I don't have great artistic tendencies, but I would say the Boundary Waters is a place where um, it, it, moments and, and places are indelible. Uh, even if you're, if you're not thinking about slowing down and noticing, you almost can't help uh, but be touched by that. It must just be a beautiful place to make art. Uh, but I have a follow-up question maybe for Joshua. So you take all your gear with you. Yeah. We heard about bugs. Yes. <laughs> How often do the bugs get on the canvas? Yeah. Um, that is a great compliment from nature when a bug is flying along <laughs> and cannot discern the difference. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're painting and the sky beyond it. And then it's there memorialized. Sometimes they have like a little death crawl from, from the sky into a shadow. And then you wait until the paintings dry and you can brush them off into places. Sometimes you can, like, I, it's, it's just part of it. It's just, you know, it's, at first you're annoyed and then you're like, it's like a rite of passage. It's, you know, it's like a sunburn. <laughs> or the rain or the wind that blew over your easel. It's your, the same things that when we go to places like the Boundary Waters, or we go camping, we you're distilling away, you're, you're sifting away a lot of the extra stuff we've done to comfort ourselves, to create something stable. And when you're creating in, this, in that place, the clouds are passing and one cloud changes all. Mm -hmm. and, and especially as a early parent, I'm like, I'm trying to work on this. <laughs> you gave me this gift. You encouraged me to be out here. <laughs> why the cloud? And but it 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 shows you one the clouds can reveal the way the shadow falls will reveal the role and undulation of the landscape. It makes you appreciate the brighter places. There's always an opportunity available at all of those challenges, and not unlike the speed of a canoe, it slows you down. And you pay attention in a different way. I remember as a kid watching the swirls endlessly from from my paddle, and or or the way the you know you're very aware of the wind. Is it for you or against you? You know, not unlike the clouds. And so that tether to nature. I was reading in this fly fishing book about the guy was talking about fly fishing. He's like that line. It's not just about catching a fish, it's that thing that pulls you back into the wild. Mm -hmm. And I can feel its strength and its rawness through that little filament of line. And so for me, the line is a different, it's a different line, but you're still feeling the ebb and flow of all around you. You can't possibly take it all in. You have to distill it to the essentials and sometimes you wanna throw the painting and you know, as my wife would remind me, but you got to be out there all day. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. whether or not the painting in the end is the thing by which it helps me pay attention, the same way a journal might for somebody else or the camera. Mm -hmm. And so, you bring all this stuff, but also learning you're always like, 20 years of doing this is there's, it's addition by subtraction. I'm forever pruning out of my kit that which the just-in-case items <laughs> in places like the boundary waters are a great exercise but if you didn't need it here you don't need it oh, that's very interesting i'll, I'll, I'll uh, piggyback a little bit about you know, whether it's bugs or wind or having the right supplies what are other challenges that you faced rain 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 <laughs> during the cold and and some of the portages can be pretty rugged so difficult walking, yeah. So 
And you do a lot of paddling up there, I, I know, from chatting with you briefly. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, the last, uh, whenever I've been up there, I've been on a, uh, a loop style trip. So, mm -hmm. portaging, paddling, or maybe camping. I never have had any time to fish, and that's it. You're too busy, <laughs> you know, trying to get to the <coughs> campsite. So. Have you always created art from each of the trips that you've made? No, not at all. No, I, um, those early trips that I was in um, in the 70s, I never, I took a camera, but nothing, no artwork. No. Is it intentional then? You know when you go if you're going to want to come back and... Oh yes, I would say very much. Um, and that's probably why I never go fishing and photographing. Yeah. Yeah, I, I need to have as much free time. I'm the cook too, so... It's like, it's the golden hour. I want to be out there photographing, and um, sometimes I'm, you know, feeding the family. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Understood. Yeah. Holly, how about for you? What kind of challenges do you face either on the North Shore or, or other places? Well, I, I, it's similar, only I have it easier because I'm not in a canoe, you know, and so I have, I have different pack, like a drawing packet. <laughs> painting packet and a sketchbook packet. But um, just to kind of if you kind of think about my way of being in the woods, uh, when I first uh, came to Minnesota, I would only go to two waterfall sites so that I could learn about um, the area and kind of sensitize myself to the geology. And uh, uh, just a little slip up when you're talking about wind and rain and backing up to Quatico, but I found that really exciting because it, it changed my perception of the place constantly. So all that was happening around me was really, in, you know, influencing my emotional response as well. So I've always been interested in what is, what is it that's making me res uh, respond to these emotions or feelings and how can I put that in my work? So structure's always been really important to me. So observing the two waterfalls for like six years and only going there uh, was really critical and I would draw very small. And then um, I branched out a little bit and I started, then the sketchbook became really important because it wasn't a sketchbook used for a preliminary, like what I'm gonna do. The sketchbook was used to find a place and understand the surrounding areas. So um, after um, a while, I noticed that every element or subject has its own rhythm that's affected by the atmosphere of the season. <clears throat> and if I'm lucky or fortunate at that time, I can work with that rhythm. And light is usually one of the big factors. So I'm sitting in the forest and it's a um, dense area and the, I am, I'm doing a longer drawing now and it, a light passage just opens up on drawing and I anticipate and wait for the next light passage. So that's one kind of rhythm you're working with in, you're going with nature. And then the opposite, opposite is when those moments hit where that cloud cover opens, the light change, the whole landscape is transformed into a completely new world. And you just can't believe you're witnessing it and I'm grabbing everything I can <laughs> simultaneously. <laughs> Not really, but photographing and sketching and then mostly a color study for me is really critical for when that happens. And then I carry all that back to the studio and work from all of that information. So that's kind of my process. Tell me more about the color study. How, how, how are you, are you capturing that or is it just Photography. Oh no no painting. Sorry. Okay, so you're okay, yeah. so you're trying to capture those yeah, colors. Either so pesto, whatever I yeah. have. Okay. Yeah. And so it's a very quick study, but it's uh, trying to, you know, like at this moment this color and then this color changes and you just rapidly are putting that down from location. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the work is complete and then sometimes it's a gathering of this information. Mm -hmm. Through photographs too. I mean so um, I do work, I have to work on location. I have, that's part of what I need because I can, um, I, I can't stay in the studio as much. I really start shutting down. I have to, I start not wanting to paint anymore. As soon as 
I go outside again. I go, oh, this is what I like to see. <laughs> yeah, so that was a long winded story. No, that was a wonderful story. Yeah. <laughs> William, how about you? Challenges? Um, well, again, I don't. I used to draw and attempt to paint outside. Uh, and it just got, I don't know. I'm a bug attractor. <laughs> and, uh, My wife is one of those too. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you're good people to paint with. <laughs> I'm the one with you in the mask. It's always appreciated. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, um, I, I like to just go out. And the nice part about using photographs is that you can take five photographs and combine a lot of the things that you like uh, using all of them. And like right now I'm working on a watercolor that I took the photograph in last spring or something. And, um, but it, it was uh, about, um, it was about, you know, trying to get as much information as I can. And with a camera, I'm able to move and, you know, I don't have a, one of those drone things. <laughs> but the image is important to me. I mean, it's the whole thing. But um, using photography, uh, I know the Impressionists and some of the, the influence on me were the groups, uh, the Canadian painters. Mm -hmm. And I, I endlessly look at books like that and, and get an idea of what what I want to deal with next. And um, so, you know, that those are the things. I remember I was fishing on this lake after going up a river and uh, canoeing. And all of a sudden, the sky, and being on an icebreaker out in Lake Michigan, you you knew right away when the weather was going to change. Mm -hmm. And I remember sitting there watching it, but I was drawing. And uh, I happened to uh, work on um, work on that drawing until the, the storm. And it was a great storm. I mean, it was just wonderful. Uh, you know, <laughs> it, it had lightning and colors like the clouds were kind of greenish blue and this thing was moving in and I thought I'm not going to make it back to my car before I get absolutely soaked and that's exactly what happened and uh, it rained harder than I've been in for a long time <laughs> but on the icebreaker I would always look for uh, opportunities to see what a sunset looks like, to see what a sunrise looks like, and um, all of that, all of that stuff has, has literally influenced my work. And a lot of the pieces that I've done here have come out of my head, you know, without photographs, without anything. And um, I'm so in tune with the boundary waters that. It is just a joy for me to, to work with that. I just, I love to deal with that. And uh, I'll do it for the rest of my life. Joy is a good word. Yeah. For, uh, for those special <laughs> places that we have. Yeah. All right, I, 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 I'm curious as a, as just an observer and loving to be outside, I occasionally will come across an artist working outside. And my presumption always is they don't, they're not, they don't want to be bothered. So I, I may admire what they're doing, but I'll scurry off. One, is that accurate? And two, have you ever had a, a funny or really frustrating experience with somebody uh, interrupting you or, or talking to you while working mm -hmm. outdoors? Oh my goodness. Um, public engagement <laughs> is, I, at first it used to, it used to bother me and, cause you're just trying to get 
you're just, it took you so much to get, especially when I started, I had little tiny people. And so like by the time I got out, you know, I was just excited to not have a diaper bag on my shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, kind of felt like I was pulling the ripcord and jumping out of the floor. You take care of me. <laughs> and, and, and so off I would go to have this, you know, each, every day when I went to work that it was like an adventure. And, and at first it was like an interruption and then gratefully, as I eased into it, I realized like that is someone's chance to engage with the art where they didn't have to make an appointment. Like essentially they didn't miss their appointment with life and neither did you. And you just didn't know you were on the calendar together until that moment. And so like a real sweet example of this is doing it all public painting event in Door County for this event. And uh, everybody, there was like 20 of us who were painting, we're picking all these spots in this um, group of kind of the amoeba of people were building <laughs> group to group. And if you watch each painter and some painters had kind of a following and so they had more people behind them and we're just working away and visiting with people as they'd come by. And all I would, what I've learn to do is if I'm whatever I'm thinking about in the painting and trying to do I just start saying that out loud so that that's kind of the conversation and it keeps me on track in a different way and otherwise I will ask about your kids and the <laughs> and so so one woman stayed after everybody was leaving I'm a little bit of a slower painter and so she's like is it okay if I stay and watch and I said sure and so we start visiting a little bit and she, you know, we do the where are you from and, and, um, and she said she's from a town north of Chicago and I said, oh, we met. And she's like, yeah, but everybody guesses Evanston. And I said, oh, I have a very social block and I know we met because my neighbor across the street, her brother lives there. She's like, what's your brother, what's the brother's name? And I said, it's Andy Sushre. And she's like, are you kidding me? His wife Janelle and I are dear friends and our sons are roommates in Marquette. <laughs> now prior to that, we had never met or known one another. And had I been a broth or brochure, just all about my painting, we wouldn't have realized we had this people, these people in common who are both near and dear to both of us, right? And she couldn't afford to buy the painting. It was right after the pandemic. And I said, well, I said, I have to turn in all of the paintings for this event. I said, but no one's going to buy it. I said, it's your painting. I said, it'll be fun. People will walk by and be like, oh, that's great. And then no one will buy it. I said, you should come to the show and watch people not buy this painting. <laughs> and, <laughs> so, and that's what happened. I won, it was great. Like, I sold almost everything except for that painting. And, and, uh, Two years later, my daughter gets accepted to Northwestern and we have admitted students day in Evanston. And I, and she and I had been, this woman and I had been in touch over the years, it had been years. And it still hadn't been a good time to get the painting. I said, hey, I'm gonna be in Evanston this weekend. I'm gonna throw the painting in the car. If you want to see it, great. And if it's a good time for you, even better. And so we met one of those mornings for coffee, and here she is looking at the painting she watched me paint two years before. And she has tears in her eyes, she's opening it up. And she's telling me about the rest of the day. It was her birthday. Mm -hmm. She had um, been visiting with her mom, and her mom and her would always come down and watch the artist paint, because that was a regular spot for that event but her mom's health was failing and she couldn't come down that day. So she had to decide if she was gonna be miserable with her mom who was in a miserable mood, <laughs> or she could just go down on her own and watch the artist paint. And, and so this, like all of these things, and it was, you know, it was her birthday, all of these things, you know, and so we, you don't know the space you're making when you make a little room. Now that's a very, grand version of that but you don't know when it's going to happen or where and so it's, it's neat that it ends in a sale that part's always nice because they also get like a receipt <laughs> that this encounter happened but I mean it's it's so much more than that 
That is an incredible story. Yeah. Yeah. Apparently, that's going to be a hard one to talk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I rarely paint outside, so I, I can't offer that much uh, experience. I used to paint a little bit outside of, around the Isles, and I have to say, though, I'm pretty private, so I like yeah. to. And, and you paint in your studio, it's just you, you're not just me, working with others. And, uh, yeah, and a podcast. So, sure. yeah. so it's private, yeah, I'm private. As a, I would think it'd be there. hard to be, to be, you know, mm -hmm. even in, in your grace and, and deciding to open up and and have those moments, um, mm -hmm. it, it must be distracting, mm -hmm. um, unless, it, unless you let it inform what you're doing or you can just tune it out, but I'm impressed. Uh, especially in a situation where you're all around the gaggles of people. How, how about you, Molly? I do try to avoid the people, too. <laughs> <laughs> but um, there, there have been situations where I just really had a, really wanted to do something and I knew there would be more people. But I've gotten used to timing that at like 11 o'clock, a lot of people are going to watch the waterfall. And then there's like pockets of the day when I know I can leave there. But um, it's uh, after that story, I just, I, I, don't know. Um, I guess some, when I, I don't know if this is, um, people often want me to take their picture. They want me to stop and take their picture. <laughs> and so, I, I, and it's okay if, like, there are moments when I, you know, you're painting and you go, oh, I could use a break anyway. But then one day, this woman, she wanted me to take the picture with her son, and then she goes, could you move a little to the right? And oh. then, you know, like, I would, like, she made me rearrange that photo so many times, I'm thinking, you're pushing me. <laughs> <laughs> it was fine. It's, it's fine. But I do try to, now particularly, because I'm not always enjoying waterfall, I can find some very quiet places. Mm -hmm. <laughs> William, any experience uh, on, the gun, on the gun front? Yeah. Well, I taught at the uh, school. For, oh, wow. And uh, so when I went out to find my students, uh, I would be looking all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember um, one of the other people that was up there were, were friends of my uncle's. And... Uh, I didn't mind talking to them, but it's when somebody would come up behind me when I was painting and start asking questions like, uh, um, what kind of paper do you use and what's this and what's that? And I'm a very solitary person when I paint. I don't like to be interrupted for anything. And, um, but I, up on the gunflint, I don't know how to say it, it's magic to me. It's just a magic place. And I remember one time, poor Angie, um, I was going, we went out to do snow, uh, snowshoe. And it was pretty close to 20, 25 below zero. And I remember thinking, what am I gonna do if, like if the car breaks down, or what am I gonna do with this and that and this and that? But I got some of the best information, uh, and that's what I call my photography. It's information to me. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, you're trying to uh, you're trying to deal with nature the way it presents itself. And sometimes I should bring a chainsaw with me. <laughs> and, and, Oh, that tree's no good. <laughs> <laughs> but I've, I've run into all kinds of things. I've had time to fish up there. I caught a northern one time up on the, that same river I'm talking about that broke my rod. And I was down at Sieverson Gallery. Mm -hmm. And I, I told them that. And I could see the look of disbelief on their face. And I said, hang on, I've got some photographs of you. <clears throat> And it was of the Norman with the with the thing in his mouth, but um, my rod was just busted, and uh, it was a good size one. But the Boundary Waters offers me personally, and I know it does with Angie too, uh, 
arrested from the madness that that was in my world, you know. Um, working with murderers and child molesters and and uh, people that you can't imagine, and um, having started the art programs in the prison, a lot of people would come and talk to us. There are people from Japan that would come and talk to us. Um, but it, for me personally, uh, the Boundary Water is a place for me to hide. And it's so solitary, and I look for that solitary. And I know Angie does too. And so it's uh, it's always been a, just an unbelievable place to me. Mm -hmm. And it's presented so many opportunities for artwork. And, uh, for that, I'm very thankful. Yeah, no, that's so well said. Um, I want to ask another practical question. So you all use photography in one sense or another. Uh, I love taking photos in the body waters, and I, I used to, you know, run my my one good camera with a couple of lenses um, and, and try to get up early for just the right light. Um, and now I just use an iPhone. <laughs> yeah. Do you? Do you all? Uh, what's what? How do you, what kind of equipment is it important? Is it, is it just capturing it? You know, is it iPhone or is it something else? Uh, iPhone for me. I'm, uh, actually, I prefer a movie because you, know, you can just switch mm -hmm. to that. Mm -hmm. And I don't know the difference of how it's processing the information, but I find there's more ambient light. I find it brings the movement back to life, which is in the sound. So it's got a few more tumblers to tip off my senses, you know, to bring me back to the place. Because mostly I'm trying to get back there, you know, and let the let the, that be the, the way back. And so whatever I can use to, to like holding it with the film and then just like walk around or, you know, touching a waterfall, you can kind of get the feeling of how it comes. Almost like treads on a tank, they, it doesn't, come down like this, it comes down, you know, these sheets almost. And so, and you're just, you're just allowing it, to un allowing it to unfold. And you never know when you're gonna have fun, like a deer, because like when I'm there, I'm there for hours and I'm kind of still. And creatures will forget that I'm there. And so they kind of wander in and we have this mutual experience of shock <laughs> and startle. And, you know, whoever snorts first loses and then off we go. <laughs> But the but that's the primary. That's if I'm going to use something, that's the one that's in the pocket. And that's mm -hmm. what it's going to be. How about you, Charlie? I'm the phone guy. Yeah. 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 I mean, I used to shoot black and white film and big cameras and all that, but the phone is so easy to use and offers so much information. You know, you, and you can have it instantly, and you can devise right there, and, mm -hmm. and you can also share it too. So. Mm -hmm. Holly. I've never been a photographer, so I, I've never used a camera of my own to make an expression. So I'm, I'm an iPhone. <laughs> so for me, it's just uh, supplemental information because more. more <coughs> sure. William? Um, I use a, a, a camera. And. Uh, <coughs> I was not allowed on computers and all those things at the prison. Mm -hmm. And so I never learned really how to deal with all that. And um, thank God my wife knows how to do something. <laughs> but uh, no, I'm a, I'm a camera person. Mm -hmm. And I also like the process, you know, doing this and doing that. Mm -hmm. One year I was up there for uh, probably a week, and I had just I had just gotten a um, Mamiya, you know, spare camera, mm -hmm. and I ran twenty rolls of film through it, and then found out I was loading the phone back. Oh, no. No. Oh, no. Oh, no. This year I didn't get much information. <laughs> <laughs> When you go to pick up your film and you see zero on the payment thing, it's like, oh, oh. Uh -huh. <laughs> I remember those moments when you just think you've got the best. And yeah. Oh, there were some shots yeah. I thought, these are but great. Yeah, nice. mm -hmm. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. That's, oh, that's all good to know.
Um, you know, before I get to my next question, anything uh, from the folks out here? Any questions that you're looking to ask or follow up on? Sure. Well, if you talk about using cameras sort of to remind you and maybe, maybe records of your thoughts, and have you ever used words to influence what you look at and how, what you say? Has that ever guided you? William, you want to start? Sure. Um, I, I find that using photography brings me close to the uh, um, the image itself and that's all I need is like I say that information and once I have the information I don't have to be a slave to what I'm looking at it's it's just that thing where I can pull it out and go oh yeah I remember this and uh, it's just I use the word in um, information because that's basically what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's funny, I would go down, I was into the, a period where I did, um, where I did cityscapes, things like that. And I found that I would get enough information to, uh, to work on the painting, but, um, and this is true. I would walk in. I would be walking down in the railroad yards and stuff like that, and I'd run into old students. <laughs> we would talk. You know, I was, I was going to look at uh, a painting at the Capitol one time, and it was done by um, Howard Pyle, who taught Andrew Lyon how to uh, paint. And it's a battle scene, and I'm telling you, it is one of the finest paintings I've ever seen. And uh, so I would, I would gain that energy, if you would, and um, try to, uh, in a sense, uh, just my mind is pretty good when I, when I look at information, and, and then I paint from there. Did everyone in the back hear the question? Just want to make sure. Yep. Okay. Good. Holly, any any words or other things that stay with you to capture that? Oh yeah. Um, I mean, I did uh, reading. Um, I, you know, whenever I'm working on, I know writers can be so helpful. They have the words that I don't. Mm -hmm. And I I love when I can find out. You know. I, you know, sometimes it's so internal that I don't, I don't even know how to really explain it. And you read something and go, oh, I found the connection. And you know, that's very helpful. I, I do that quite a bit. I journal a lot in the morning, I, when I'm, especially when I'm by myself working. And that, that's really helpful too. So words are important. Yeah, that's a good question. I think I get to a more of a feeling state if I use language too. So I do try to write some things down. It can be really simple. It can be like a simple sentence, but that is a way of evoking a feeling that I had when I was out there, experience. Yeah. So I don't. I don't. I mean, I take thousands of photographs, and I probably will only write three sentences. But <laughs> those three sentences are, you know, enough to carry me. Um, when Andrea asked if I was willing to be a part of this and what, you know, how was it part of my creative process? And I was like, I, my first thought was to suggest three other artists and, <laughs> and, um, and then when it circled back uh, to me again, um, I was remembering the Boundary Waters more as a kid than as an artist and my dad was a police officer, and so I was thinking about how you were ta you needed this respite from the prison, and and my dad needed a respite from bringing people to the place, and and he would take all of us. I'm in the middle of five boys. And I'm like, man, I don't know if that was a huge upgrade to take five boys <laughs> into the into the wild, but the um, but he did. He would moonlight as a security guard at Hoy Guards in St. Louis Park. 
And with the money he made and the employee discount, he would buy the rental canoes and the beat up demo tents and all that stuff became our stuff. And on one of the canoes, it was this old town and it had uh, these wood gunnels and on the bow of it, he had a little plaque made. And we didn't have a lot, so something like a plaque really stood out and I wrote my brothers this morning because I was trying to check it to make sure that was the they um that one of them wrote back one of the words. So it's he had the last stanza of a Robert service poem. And uh let us probe the silent places. Let us seek what luck betide us. Let us journey to the lonely land. I know, there's a whisper on the night wind, there's a star a gleam to guide us. And the wind is calling, let us go. And I was amazed how much of it I remembered. And more so that out of the life of whether he was wrestling with all of our personalities or the personalities of his fellow officers or the personalities of all of the people that he was engaging with as a police officer. You know, those words. And the Lonely Land is also a title of a Sigurd Olsen book. And he would read those to us as kids. Those were our bedtime stories. And the Francis Jacquis illustrations of those and those books were my, like, I was always sad when we would turn the page. Mm -hmm. Oh, like, can we have, there should be more drawings in this book. <laughs> Which is kind of my feeling about every book. But, <laughs> but those, all of those things become, it's such an interesting, someone invites you to do something like this, and you, there's this uh, almost like an imposter, I'm like, I don't think they're enough to be someone speaking about it. And then you realize in that, that this place was an incubator. Mm. And it was, uh, you know, the, the acorn was dropped and it took a long time for, you know, it to show up and in the other places you go. And so it's such a, mm. so those words actually were percolating all week. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Special dad and uh, wonderful experiences. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It brings to mind another question. Um, did you have childhood moments or influences that catapulted to a career in art? I'll just jump off from saying clear my throat. Um, you had mentioned Howard Pyle teaching um, Andrew Wyatt. It was actually his dad. It was Andrew oh, Wyatt's dad. Right. It was uh, MC. MC Wyatt. MC Wyatt, teacher. who yeah. illustrated a lot of Scribner, Scribner's novels like Treasure Island. And, and he even took like he took the best of Pyle and his own billowing personality and, and brought it out. But Andrew Wyatt's work was the work that touched me as a kid. My dad had this book of his stuff and it sat at the top of the stairs. And one of his other moonlighting jobs, he worked security at this bookstore. And they had just gotten in the Andrew Wyatt book and he would look at it because there wasn't much else, not a lot of crime fighting happening at the bookstore. And one day he went in and he said the book was gone and he felt like a panic. And so he's like, when is it, are you guys getting more? Are you getting more? And the owner said, yeah, we're gonna get some in next week. And as soon as it came in, he bought it. He didn't give it a second thought. And it cost him about, I think he said $80. Mm -hmm. Cause about, 14 years ago when he was still alive, I told him, I think that book's a big reason why I'm doing this. Mm -hmm. And he said, I'm so glad something good came out of it. <laughs> he said, because when I bought that book, I had no business buying that book. And he told me this, this story and he said, I had to sit for about 10 days before I got paid again. Mm -hmm. And I had about 50 bucks in the checking account. So that means nothing had to go wrong at the house. <laughs> Nobody could get sick. The car had to be perfect and we couldn't host anything. <laughs> so that we could make, he says that was the longest 10 day stretch I can remember. 
as a young guy financially. And so that was all because of that book. <laughs> he, he probably didn't know at the time, but the values that he had clearly carried on in you and yeah. probably your brother. No, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. How about you, Charlie? I think it was uh, the artist that lived with us for about three or four months uh, growing up, and he painted um, the portraits of all the entire family, except my dad. He would. <laughs> but this man who's Italian, very flamboyant, and uh, he was having so much fun, and he was creating this magic. I mean, he was just, he's a realist painter, and he, he was able to capture the personality and the surroundings of all of us. And uh, I have a twin brother, and he, he did paint the difference between us. So, I mean, I just saw that he had <coughs> an alchemical feeling for the world, so, inspiring him. He inspired me. I struggled on this one. <laughs> I didn't have uh, a lot of that um, home, you know, I didn't really see a painting until I was in uh, somewhere in junior in high school. I knew a painting. Wow. So, um, but as, as later in life, you know, uh, I, I know my dad bought me kind of like books. So that was, that was a huge event. But I was always making things, but I, I really, um, I, I kind of just like that. You found your way, though. I found my way. And I did move in next to a neighbor who was an artist. <laughs> so that was pretty exciting. And she, she actually was, you know, that whole reflection about doing this, uh, and you really start thinking of how your life, all the people that connected and those threads that really do ring through it. And, uh, when I think of her just really briefly, um, she, I wanted to go to Chicago and a small town, you know, and she uh, linked me up with uh, this woman who helped me find a one room and, and then I interviewed to be a guard at the Art Institute of Chicago and that was a pivot. So to look at paints for paintings eight hours a day, and that was, so she was pivotal. Thanks for reminding I never thought about that in a long time. So. How about you, Wayne? Did I ever eat cock? My brain is gone. No. Um, question? Er, early influence that oh, led you to, uh, yeah, thank you to be an artist? Yeah. Uh, again, my uncle was an extremely uh, good artist and he eventually taught drawing at, at BU and um, but every time I would go over to his house I would see paintings in progress and and that kind of thing and that the influence that that had on me was uh, amazing and I have to admit when I do art I, I just lose myself and sometimes that's what a person needs, you know, he needs to just step into another reality and, and go from there. And I've got to tell you before I forget, fly fishing. Have you ever read Hemingway's Big Hearted River? No. <laughs> right. yeah. um, and the, where he talks about was where I was stationed on the Sunday, mm -hmm. up in Chardoy, Michigan which was uh, just an incredible place. But anyway, back to art. Um, I started painting when I was a kid, very early, and I did a painting for my mother, and uh, she just loved it, and I, I have it now. And, um, but it, it was always such a joy for me to, uh, um, be able to uh, have a blank piece of paper and find something in there that I could uh, pull out. And uh, it, it is truly, there were times when I would be painting and thinking, I'm so goddamn lucky. I really am to be able to do artwork and want to continue doing artwork. And so, uh, to me, it's been a, a blessing, if you will, to be able to do artwork. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, thanks for sharing that.
right, next question. I think this, this question is one that I've asked a number of people, not just artists, but a uh, moment um, in the Boundary Waters or, or somewhere else that stands out. Uh, I think those of us who have been to the Boundary Waters and, and know it's a special place have many of those moments that have just been touching, whether it's a, a particular challenge or just a beautiful moment or a connection with somebody. Is there something that stands out to you? And it can be North Shore, it can be Badlands. I, Charlie, I think I remember you had an artist in residence. Was that you? Yeah, that's Badlands? correct. Yeah. 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 Another amazing place. But is there something that stands out that you'd like to share? Uh, Someone else go first. Sure. <laughs> Charlie, <you're laughs> sure. That's okay. um, it's interesting, I would say the most powerful experiences up there are not aesthetic, it's when I am deeply humbled. And um, oftentimes, I, I know this is gonna sound silly, but I think of myself as a real navigator, I can get around, I can, like my wife Becky always says, he always knows what drainage is. <laughs> and uh, that's more like something to do with, you know, being out west, but, um, I mean, there was one trip, my second trip uh, into the Boundary Waters where we had been out all day and I was completely lost at the end of that day. I had no idea where it was. Mm -hmm. And I, and uh, where it was, they used to have these uh, maps, I don't know if you remember them, yeah. but I mean, it was just shapes and there was no, uh, I mean, no, you got no elevations. I mean, you couldn't, if you weren't watching the shoreline continuously or, you know, you, you watch, yeah. Even with a compass, you'd get lost. Anyway, so we've been out there for most of the day and I said, I am lost. And you know, this is, the, you know, this is my wife and I'm thinking, oh man, this is really <laughs> stupid. Anyway, so we saw a canoe way off in the distance and I thought, oh, we're gonna need this person. So we started paddling towards them, and luckily they didn't start paddling away. <laughs> and we eventually met up with them, and as it turned out, it was a group of outward bound students and a leader. And I actually knew the leader, strangely. And she said, well, you know, you are going completely in the wrong direction. And she turned us around and um, got us, you know, on track. And so it's something about that being, you know, completely overwhelmed and humbled is what has stuck with me the most. Humbled is a is a good term and emotion for mm. yeah. a lot of us at times up there. Yeah, yeah. Holly, how about you? Well, I know I know that question, but uh, I kind of wanted to go back to my original Please, yeah. experience at Quatico uh -huh. because uh, it was. Uh, it was such an um, incredible thing for me uh, to want to step into the wilderness. And um, I don't know if I'm gonna say this all right, but it, it impacted me uh, so much, this world that I entered. And that, I mean, I remember the sensation of being on the canoe and in relatively calm water and the way the light hits the water and it entered my body. That, the peacefulness just entered my body. And I knew I, everything about that trip was so new that all your senses are really heightened. So every, every change in weather, uh, wind, uh, meant something to me. And um, I, I, I knew that I, I, this was where I was gonna develop my life. I, I needed to find ways to get back into the wilderness. And then the second experience was, it was an important assignment. He told us to do 10 rolls of film. I had never done a half a roll. <laughs> and then edited down to 10 slides. And it was so amazing to me that everybody's was different. I know that shouldn't be amazing, but I thought we're all in the same place. How can they be this different? And there was something about the, the assignment being that you, you should look, look at this place and what is uniquely different about this place or your experience in this place that you've never had before than any other place. By doing that, he helped me hone in on a way to look at the landscape that is 
huge, a way to kind of pull it into yourself. So that has helped me coincidentally, because Bill and I have moved several places across the states. Every place I've landed, I've sought out remote locations to find and become intimate with them. And it's helped me um, adjust and um, be aware. So that experience turned out to be I mean, everything kind of builds up. I've talked about sense of place before, but it just sort of came together. And uh, I didn't really realize the impact it would have forever for someone. Thank you. Leah, how about you? <coughs> um, are we talking about uh, things that a moment that uh, just stands out from one of your times. You've already shared some pretty cool moments. Yeah. But, uh, you know, a moment in a special place that was particularly memorable. Well, one of them was I was driving through Wyoming to the Big Horns for, yeah. And uh, I saw this. I don't know what they called them. They were uh, places where they kept things cool, you know, made out of rock and timber. And there was a big door, and, and I thought, I want to photograph that. So I went up and over the fences and did all that. And I walked up to this place, um, literally without thinking about the things that are out there that aren't here. And all of a sudden, I heard this rattle, mm -hmm. uh -oh. and I thought, oh, shit, <laughs> this is not good. Yeah. And so I froze, because I didn't know where it was. And I started looking around like this, and I take a step back, and eventually, I, I just jumped back. And of course, I needed to know where it was, so I, I slowly went up until it started rattling again. And it was in a little cove off this thing. And it was a rattlesnake. And if it would have hit me, it would have hit me on the side of the face or in my neck, which would, probably wouldn't have been very good. And I, I've never gotten that out of my mind. I mean, seriously, mm -hmm. never. And the other moment that I remember so well is the idea that I would uh, I would seek out the the quiet places too, you know, and um, I was always been always fortunate to be able to find them, and uh, some are better than others, and you know you do what you do, and uh, but it was extremely important to me to just look at things. I would sit and look at. <laughs> the painting I did for my mother were, were pine trees, and I remember painting them as I thought they were. It's like school time Christmas trees, and the yeah, and the branches went down <laughs> until I looked at a pine tree, <laughs> and I realized Jesus Christ, they go up. <laughs> and. Uh, that was, like a, that was like an epiphany for me. And uh, those are the things I would share with my students. And, and uh, you know, I had some really gifted, talented students. But you always had to remember what they were. You know? And um, I was told that it, on Christmas we were able to bring in, I would pay for it, but we'd be able to bring in a tray of meat and stuff like that for the inmates uh, for my class and uh, I would do that and, and I was also a very good chess player and this one student challenged me to a chess match and I beat him and I didn't know that he was like the institution chess master or something and he, he came to me the next day and said, uh, can I talk to you for a minute? I said, yeah. And uh, he said, remember that razor knife that was laying on the table? And I said, yeah. And he said, I was going to cut you with that. 
And I said, probably be the last time you would have cut somebody. Because um, I've been in a couple fights in the prison. You're not supposed to, but, you know, I, I've seen some really crazy things. Some bad things. Yeah, yeah, in prison, you cannot imagine in your wildest imagination how it's dangerous like, some of these people are. Sounds like you were a good instructor. <laughs> well, I started art programs and people would come from around the country yeah. to find out why we were so successful. Mm -hmm. And I used to run in a street gang when I was a teenager in high school. And I learned a lot of things from that. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it was more like West Side Story without the singing and dancing. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but, you know, you... Again, I'm, I'm just, I feel so, I, I can't use any other word, but I feel so blessed that I have, I have a talent that I love more than love. A talent that I wouldn't be able to um, live without. And uh, so, yeah, I've seen a lot of things. I could tell you so from the prison where uh, you would say, okay, this is done, we'll see you all later. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them are so bad you can't imagine. Mm -hmm. um, well, let me let me stop you there. Thank you for sharing. I've got one more question before I get to that. Did you, did you want to share a moment? Oh, sure. The um, I had taken a D when I was you know, 19, so I knew most of everything there was. I didn't think I was good <laughs> enough at art to do it. So I decided to follow my dad's footsteps into law enforcement and, and through a series of different events happened and, and it pulled me back into art. And it would, as I was coming home, essentially, I remember I was out fishing with some friends on a lake and I actually mostly paddled, I didn't fish that much. And, uh, and the evening, the sun was setting and the, these big, beautiful clouds were just kind of lollygagging through the sky. And they caught the sunset, but they were on the opposite side. And they reflected all of the light back into the bowl of the lake, for lack of a better phrase. And it changed the color of everything, but it wasn't a very strong light source because it's reflected off of a cloud. And it changed the mood of everything, the sound seemed to be different, and, and the sense of a soft, warm light changing everything, and it wouldn't be, it would be years, years and years and years and years before I ended up thinking about landscape painting, and even then it was like, yeah, that'd be good to know, and, and the first, day I took a workshop and it was kind of on a lark like I really it was just really like I thought I would need to know how to do it and in the first day of the the guy I studied with still in St. Paul's name's Joe Paquette and Joe gave this lecture and the lecture started with I'm not going to teach you how to paint a tree or the sky or the water or a house or a barn I'm going to teach you how to paint the day and this palette these colors are set up almost, he didn't describe it this way, but I've come to understand it like grammar. Like it's a, these things are available to help you structure a visual language to express the day. And he says, so I want all of you to, and you guys can do this right now. All of you imagine somebody you lost. Just bring them right with you. And now imagine that you get to have that person with you for a day. Are you gonna care if it's cloudy? Mm -hmm. Windy, cold, hot, foggy, whatever. Or is that going to be one of the best days of your life? He said, then that awareness and gratitude for the day is available every day with practice. And when I was listening to this, oh, I said earlier, I'm in the middle of five boys. We had lost <coughs> the youngest one a few years before. So, 
And it was, I was like, this is, sometimes, now there was nothing in the paintings that followed that lecture that would be indicative <laughs> of, yes, he'll be talking about this with people later. Um, they were all terrible. And, but I loved being there. And you, the failure stung. It stung my ego, it stung my confidence, it stung my sense of, purpose it didn't it didn't match like I understood what I was being told but I couldn't make it happen and I had done lots of other things with painting that I could make happen so why was this so different mm -hmm. and and the thing that makes it so different is is that it's everything and it's all at once and that sense of awe that makes pe places like the boundary water special because it's wild because you don't get lost and get lost because you who were confined to the concrete in Chicago and in the world of other people's paintings can go get lost and then find a mechanism by which you can sift through every other place you go. And you, like my dad, finding this respite in the quiet and something so much more big and complicated and frankly wild, more wild than the prison. And yet it's at peace. You know, the, that bigness of the place, of the day, of those things to distill them through a, a little scene. You know, the, I did a little, as I was thinking about the talk today, this week, I banged up my knee in January and so I've been confined to the studio, which is, ugh. <laughs> but, but it's only because I haven't spent a lot of time there. And so I was sitting, I spent a lot of time the last couple months, sitting at the kitchen table drawing from my old paintings, from photographs that I thought I would turn into paintings and didn't. And I don't know, it was like after the third or fourth day of totally losing track of the day, I'm like, this is where you started. At the kitchen table, drawing things that caught your eye. And, you know, it might have been Sports Illustrated, or it might have been National Geographic, or Knights and Dragons from my imagination, whatever the case was. And that that thing that I was doing when I was 10, now that I'm knocking on the door at 50, and it's still available to me, and still everybody's captivating, and even more so because now my whole life is poured into it. And thinking about the image that I grabbed onto this week to make a painting from, like in that one scene, it's below a waterfall and there's dead trees and there's new trees and there's living trees and there's rocks and there's, and, and there's all this stuff going on. And at the time when I was in the boundary waters, like the reason I took a picture of that scene instead of trying to paint it when I had all my painting gear right there was because you had to get under the trees and you're almost like an army man crawling to get a view of the thing. And I'm like, well, I'm not gonna be able to paint on my belly. <laughs> and so I took a video of it and then I went and painted something else. And and so, and here was this thing awaiting to just stir up all this stuff. And so these experiences that all of us have with nature, not just artists, that bigness can pull us out of our daily life. And a place like the Boundary Waters provides a wilderness where you let go of so much of the stuff we build around us, right? I mean, ideally, I mean, you have to put your phone in a Ziploc, right? You need it sealed. <laughs> and and so, so it doesn't get ruined. And so it doesn't ruin your trip, frankly. And, and it's such a special that sense of being at the edge of Right? Is the, what if the car breaks down? Right? Like that has your attention in a different way. And that gets into your work in a different way. And the memory of that when you're back in the studio is in you in a different way. Yeah, thank you very much for sharing. I'm going to close out with one last question and, and ask for a, a shortish answer. Uh, but I think. Um, I said this call, but. <laughs> I, uh, I think you're all here probably because. You, well, you love art. You love some of this art. Maybe you've been familiar with these artists, um, and or you're you're uh, you, you're familiar with the Boundary Waters. You love the Boundary Waters. Maybe you care about preserving the Boundary Waters. Um, art plays a role in helping to determine the fate of our natural places. I think in, in lots of ways. But 
how does what does that mean to you uh, in terms of how your art might play a role in helping with the understanding of, of maybe the preservation of uh, the memory of places that are inevitably going to change? Charlie, why don't you start? Oh my gosh, uh, you know I think of those artists that have had that kind of influence, and I don't think I'm one of them. Um, just because I don't, I don't feel like my work is driven by a polemic or a ideology in any way. So, um, you know, I, I was certainly inspired by someone like uh, Ansel Adams as a photographer, who I think had a very significant influence, <coughs> and Elliot Porter, did both of them. Mm -hmm. But I just don't think, for me personally, I just don't think painting, because it's more of an interpretation, I, I just don't see myself as having that kind of power to influence people. I bet your art is in living rooms and places where it, it creates a connection um, to people who wouldn't otherwise have it. Well, I should say, I would be pleased if that was true, but I would say that's not my intent. Sure. So I, mean, I don't see my, my work as preservationist or um, environmental necessarily. I like being in this place, though. I like being in, mm -hmm. in Boundary Waters and in the world of art. Mm -hmm. Holly, what do you think? Well, that's so interesting, but your comment about uh, the idea of connection, like when there is a painting, it might not be about uh, you know, the specific mm -hmm. idea of preservation, mm -hmm. but it's touching someone that triggers memories. And I was talking to my husband the other night, we were talking about anything that brings a positive response will help people have a more open response and awareness to the environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, well said. William, what do you think? Yeah, um, the incredible influence that the Boundary Waters has. Um, it's one of my favorite places in the world. I was lucky enough the other day to talk to a, a person that had come in from California and she said she had gone up to the North Shore and I said did you go up the Gunflint mm. and she said no I haven't mm. and I said you got to do that <laughs> and you know it I speak of it um, it's, it's like this very close friend and I've had some wonderful times up there. I've tried to do some wonderful paintings about it. And uh, it's like you get out of the car with a camera and there's 10 things you want to photograph. And, you know, it might turn out to be a one painting. And it's just, it's that influence that it has on me as a place. And um, so it's influenced me deeply. Uh, ever since then. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. Joshua, you get the last word on this. Um, short answer is yes, it does. And much to like what Holly was saying, that positive response. I think of beauty as a way of softening our shoulders. And I don't necessarily think about, oh, this can be used for this or that kind of thing. Um, mostly I think of the painting as a like a gratitude response and then it's shared and it, I think it gives a place for others to put theirs or it can be like it holds more than just uh, people and I hope people tell you guys this stuff too like uh, this reminds me of this part of my life or something totally disconnected from your experience or what you were thinking about when you made it and and we don't operate in isolation and so when we do things, and then we, you know, here we have a beautiful venue and, gen and built on generations of other artists sharing have come before me, you know, and before us. And, and we realize the sense of beauty as a baton being passed to, from one generation to the next. And places like the Boundary Waters are also a baton that are passed from one generation to the next. Mm -hmm. And the awareness, like the knowing like you don't have to go to the museum every day to appreciate it every day. 
And the knowing that it's available or the knowing that it's there, that there's this wild place in the corner, I don't know, probably back here somewhere, that, you know, that's available to you. The paintings have a way of, of doing that. They take time. They take it took time to get good at doing them or good enough to do them to the point where you're feeling comfortable and I mean that very relatively to share it it's a very uncomfortable experience to share your your work but the but it's you're also excited you know and those things you just I have found I just don't know my job is to make it so like you said like I'm not thinking about all those things when I'm making it I'm thinking about me and it and now mm -hmm. and and it has a life after that. Like my job is just to answer the invitation and then it'll do something else in the lives of other people after. That's beautifully said. Well, thank you all for sharing uh, personal stories and reflections and thanks for sharing your art with us. Thank you all for coming. Uh, we're grateful and uh, let's all uh, have a little time to, to look at the art and uh, chat, and I'm sure the artists will be available for a little while if you have any other follow-up questions. Thank you very much.